We have John Haddad here. He is an independent Cassandra consultant, and he'll be talking about time series data modeling for massive scale, which um, honestly sounds really fascinating. I'm looking forward to that. But I will hand over to John. So over to you. Here we are. We're doing it. Thanks, you. Appreciate the intro, man. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm John Haddad. Uh, I'm currently an uh, independent consultant, uh, doing a lot of Cassandra work still. Uh, X data stacks. I actually worked with uh, Patrick uh, and Josh and Brandon and, and a bunch of people who were in the call. Um, uh, X the last pickle. For those of you that, that are familiar with that, I did a lot of consulting there. Uh, X Apple. Uh, I just left Netflix in February and now I'm I've been uh, doing Cassandra consulting uh, full time. So uh, I love putting out dumpster fires. So if you've got one, let me know. <clears throat> Today we're going to be talking about time series. Uh, and specifically how to get massive scale out of it. And this is a really interesting topic for me. I've worked on this at a, at a number of different uh, organizations and I've seen a lot of different uh, approaches to the problem. Uh, so I'm gonna give a handful of tips here. Uh, this isn't gonna be uh, completely exhaustive. I, I, I wish I had more time, um, but uh, you know, hopefully we can get a few good core ideas that can help you kind of build a data model that will scale a lot better uh, than, um, than this simple one that I'm gonna show you in just a second. Uh, we start talking about time series. Uh, we're talking about data points stored over time. These can either be things that are user generated, like let's say uh, messages back and forth, right? A chat is essentially a time series, a uh, bank ledger, um, or sensor data, right? We could have multiple uh, uh, records coming in per second from a sensor. We got to store that, and you know, potentially over the lifetime of that sensor, we could have millions of readings. How do we, or billions of readings? How do we handle that correctly? Uh, application, OS metrics, user activity. Uh, and we need to roll these things up, right? So, so we need to have efficient reads uh, and we need to have a good storage mechanism, something that will work even as we get uh, to petabyte scale. So what are a few of the challenges uh, that we face? Um, we're gonna take a look at this data model. This is the simplest possible thing that you can create to handle uh, a time series. And uh, as you can see, we create the table uh, we have a, a partition key that's a uh, series and clustering key on that timestamp. And then we have some payload, right? We had just have some data. So this is pretty simple. For each series, we're going to have a single partition, and it's going to be ordered by time. There's a few issues with this, though. And uh, people run into this, uh, you know, when, once you start to grow out of, like, a smaller cluster, you can start to hit all sorts of problems. So. Um, one of the ones that you'll find when uh, with this model that uh, you may have noticed is I didn't specify a compaction strategy. So by default, uh, Cassandra is going to use size tiered compaction, which isn't really great at anything. Um, it doesn't use a ton of I.O. and it doesn't um, perform that efficiently. Um, but it's better if you've got uh, like spinning disks because it reduces I.O. a little bit, but that's not really common anymore. So it's almost never the right choice. Uh, now, depending on the workload, uh, you're either going to want to consider leveled compaction or time window compaction strategy. So we'll talk a little bit about that first. Um, leveled compaction strategy is really great uh, if you've got mutable data. Um, so time window compaction strategy uh, compacts windows of SS tables into specific uh, blocks of time. Uh, so it doesn't really work that well if we're doing updates or deletes. So if you have updates to your time series, which a lot of people will say time series is immutable, but you know we can loosely kind of talk about it uh, and, and it's okay if we're gonna apply some deletes here and there. Uh, so if we're doing updates and explicit deletes, probably better that we kind of consider uh, LCS as an option there because time window won't work that great. Um, and if you have deletes, really the only thing that you're going to want to use is TTLs uh, if you're using time window. So, and you have to use uh, TTLs unless you want to do like a weird kind of manual cleanup by logging in and like removing data files. Uh, you're going to need TTLs in order to make sure that that data expires correctly. So you're going to have to look at like how you're going to work with the data. If you're going to update it, delete it, what your retention is going to look like there. Um, then we can consider the write overhead. Level compaction strategy has fairly high write overhead because it does a lot more I.O. during compaction. So if you've got a read heavy uh, workload, um, back when I was at Netflix, we had a, a, a use case that actually uh, fit this. 
um, where we were using time window compaction strategy for its optimal uh, compaction. But on reads, it wasn't performing as well because we were just hitting too many SS tables on reads. So we ended up switching to LCS. Um, TWCS is really, really great if you're doing a ton of writes. It's super efficient. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible compaction strategy. We've been I've been recommending it for a really long time, uh, even back before it was included with Cassandra. Um, so if we're going to specify a compaction strategy, we have to say, OK, we have our original table definition. And now we're going to say we're either going to use uh, time window compaction strategy. We provide a window. Uh, so the, the, in this case, I've supplied 60 days. So essentially, after 60 days, all of the data that's sitting in that window is going to be compacted together into a single SS table, uh, and then a new window uh, starts. So it limits the amount of data that's going to be compacted at any given time by using windowing uh, to prevent uh, read and write amplification from happening. But if you're doing a read-heavy workload, like if you're, let's say, like or, or you're mixed, like 50-50 reads, writes, you're probably not going to actually get the advantages of TWCS. There's really not. Um, it's not going to help you out as much as it would if you were doing a write heavy workload. Um, so that's where you would end up using level to max strategy. So basically the, the, the deal is you're going to need to, you're going to want to test this. Like this is, this is super important. You're going to want to test it with a lot of data. <clears throat> uh, I wrote, um, actually Alex uh, Dijanovsky wrote a really good blog post back when I was at the last pickle on how to use TWCS. There's a ton of useful information in there. And since I don't have infinite time, uh, I really suggest you go read it uh, if you want to learn more about how this works. The next challenge that we face uh, when doing this is large partitions. If we have unbounded uh, time series, we can end up in some really weird situations where we either have uh, partitions that have grown to multiple gigabytes. Uh, so that leads to hotspots. We have cluster imbalances. Uh, it doesn't scale particularly well because if one node uh, is having a problem due to a, a hotspot, uh, I once worked with a customer who had 40 gig partitions and like nothing worked correctly and they were trying to figure out why couldn't they just add new nodes into the cluster? It doesn't work that way. Like there's one node or, or there's RF nodes that have that data and they're always going to struggle um, depending on the, the, the way that you're accessing the data, uh, how often you're repairing it. Um, you know, it, it has effects on compaction. And the worst part about it is you can't get parallelism on reads. So if you need to actually read a ton of that data, it's incredibly inefficient. Um, that's because of an underlying detail of how pagination works in Cassandra. So one thing that, that we need to know here that's really, really important before I get into the, the, the solution here is uh, pagination works by essentially issuing a follow-up query. So as you can see in this diagram that, that I uh, pulled from the DataStax documentation, the client executes a single query and gets partial result set back. But one of the things that comes back is this token from the server. And when the next, when the, let's say you get your first 20 records here, uh, when the next batch of records comes over, it sends that token over and that's just a starting point. So you're effectively just issuing a brand new query. So there's no real performance benefit from having a single partition that you're accessing sequentially um, it, it just doesn't have any performance advantages. So what we want to do here, one of the things that we can do is uh, start to uh, create more partitions. We actually, if, if we know that we're going to fill out, um, we're going to want to have about 10 megs per partition. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, this thing is going to grow for a really long time, just do a little math and try to plan for about 10 megs. That's my advice. Some people will tell you you can do 100. You can go. You can go pretty high now. Like modern Cassandra is much, much better at handling large partitions. But there's not really a good reason to do so. So I like to stick to 10. It's just kind of a my safe rule. Um, but if you ended up with 100 by accident, it's okay. Um, so the solution here that that uh, I'm, I'm pointing out is I've added a new field called day into the partition key. So now a partition key has the original time series ID plus a day. So every single day, we're going to be writing to a new partition. The reason why this is so great is because it allows us to uh, have very, very, uh, like, we can, we can limit the size of the partitions because there's only so much data that we're going to write in a day. 
Um, so this ends up being extremely efficient. Uh, when we use this with level of compaction strategy, it works really well because we're going to limit the number of uh, SS tables that a given uh, partition appears in. So it's better, it's, it's good for reads. Uh, and we also, what's really cool is we can, we can also query multiple days in parallel. So rather than having uh, to wait for the driver to issue uh, the query for the next page, and let's say if you wanted to get 30 days worth of data, um, and it keeps having to reissue queries, that can get pretty slow. Like depending on how many, depending on the, the uh, number of records that you're fetching at a time, you could see a lot of time being spent just waiting on results coming back from the database. So if you query things in parallel, let's say, let's take that same example, uh, if we were to have uh, that day component in the partition key, um, and you wanted 30 days worth of data, you can issue 30 queries in parallel. And with a large cluster, you're gonna uh, you're gonna spread that over the entire cluster. You're gonna get 30 result sets uh, back, and they're all gonna be they're gonna be in order the same way that they were before. Um, but you get to but you get to take advantage of the fact that you have a cluster and your data is distributed around the cluster. So instead of putting all the pressure on one node, you distribute that to all the other nodes. So that is a that is a very very effective uh, mechanism. It, it absolutely uh, helps, and if you um, you know, you don't have to use a day, you can use a week or a month. It really depends on the, uh, the data and what it kind of looks like. But like I said, that's where you're going to want to shoot for that 10 megs. Next challenge that we have, data retention. Um, this, so I mentioned TTLs already. So if you have a TTL on your data uh, and it's uh, static, so if you know that you have a one year retention and then everything TTLs out, uh, that's great. That actually makes things really easy. But if you have a variable TTL or you, you don't know what it's going to be or you think that things might change, it can be a little tricky because there's not a good way of updating your TTL for an entire table. Uh, the TTL that is, even though um, on a table definition, you'll see it says default. If you have the option to supply a default TTL, that's written with the record. That's not, that's not a, a table property that will just adjust everything. Um, it would be cool, but it doesn't work that way right now. So we, if you need a mechanism um, to have a variable TTL, maybe some data is a month, some data is a year, we need to have a different strategy in place. Uh, we also have to deal with the fact that like, it's pretty common to archive or export this data. Um, some systems will use a tool like Spark, uh, but then if you're re-exporting like all of your data every day, uh, it's kind of wasteful. It's kind of wasteful to have to read it all um, it's kind of it's definitely wasteful to write it all. Even if you only filter out yesterday's data when you export it, you still end up reading in a ton of stuff. So it's not efficient to do it that way. And then if you're using a uh, level of compaction strategy, uh, you do run the risk of uh, write, read and write uh, amplification. So as your tables get bigger uh, and you're using LCS, uh, you will be doing a ton of read and write amplification, rewriting your old time series data. There's really no point in doing this. This is what time window compaction strategy is meant to avoid. Uh, but like I said, there are some cases where you can't use it. So how do we solve this problem? Well, what I like to do is I create a table for a window of time. So this is essentially what time window compaction strategy does. We're just doing it kind of manually. Um, if we had the ability, oh no. Let me take that back. If we had the ability to uh, use LCS as the underlying algorithm under TWCS, it would solve some problems, but not all of them. Uh, this allows us to solve all of our problems. So if we now add a, a time component into the table itself, doing it, let's say, by month or by year, then what we can do is we can access a smaller subset of this time series data because we can consider the time series data in the past immutable now. So let's suppose that we follow this advice right here and we create a table uh, once per month. Um, once we are done with the month of June, we're not going to touch it again. That means that when we do a full repair, we don't have to, as long as we've repaired that data once, we don't need to repair it again. And this is kind of what's behind it. This is what's essentially the, uh, what incremental repair does. But if you have to use a full repair, you're going to end up repairing a lot of data unnecessarily. So 
Uh, using this strategy allows us to kind of group our data uh, into smaller, uh, smaller chunks. Uh, you can repair it once. Um, it's really easy to archive uh, because you can just copy all the table data off and you can just delete the table off your cluster. So if you don't know what your TTL is, for example, let's suppose we think that it's going to be three years and then it turns out that we only need it for a year. But we can just go ahead and drop the old tables now. We don't need them anymore. We don't have to keep them in Cassandra. So we'll just drop it. It's actually easier than uh, relying on TTLs. And it's, and it's more flexible in this case. Um, so we reduce our write read and write amplification. Uh, it's easier to archive. Uh, oh, if we do need to archive this data and we read the whole table, um, you only have to read a month of data at a time. So again, like these strategies, when you start to put them together, you can kind of see how, oh, we're going to, you know, we use a table per uh, day or sorry, a partition per day and maybe a table per month. Then we have 30 partitions or 31 partitions uh, in a given table uh, for a given sensor. And we can easily export it and move it around. So um, we actually uh, have had a system very similar to this uh, at Netflix and it, it worked really, really well. I mean, I assume it's still there. So if we're going to do that, uh, we have our, our table by day here, of course. Um, so those strategies are, are I, I realize I can't go into a ton of detail on them because we don't have, you know, like I said, infinite time. Um, but I've outlined uh, these strategies a little bit more in this blog post uh, that I wrote back in 2017. Um, so I go into a little bit more detail. It doesn't have, uh, it, it, it's going to have a lot of additional information that if, if you're interested in this topic, highly recommend you read it. Um, and I think that is, yep, that's all I have. All righty. Very cool, John. Thank you so much. That was great. We will see you, see you next time. Thanks very much, everyone.